Dad, what are you doing? Shh. I'm practicing for PUMC's upcoming parking lot services. More details to come. Dear God, school is different now. I don't understand the world, but I know that when hard things happen, I should pray. So that's what I do. I pray that we can keep learning, whatever that looks like, and that we'll be together, even if it's in a whole new way. God, I pray as we step into the unknown future that you continue to show me things about myself and life, things I can't learn in books. Be with me, God, no matter how this year unfolds. Help us, God, to do our best every day. Even when every day isn't what we thought it would be. Keep us safe and keep us learning, one day at a time. Thank you, God. Amen. 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 My name is Pastor Doug, and I am the pastor here at Portage United Methodist Church in Portage, Wisconsin. It is my privilege to welcome you to this worship video. Music centers us as we prepare our hearts and minds for worship.
I'm Jessica Malsack, and I'd like to welcome you to our worship for today. Please read along with the words as they appear on the screen. All throughout our lives, at home, school, workplace, or online, we are called to present ourselves as living sacrifices for God. The Spirit moves through each of us, empowering us with God's many gifts. We go forth as the body of Christ to share God's love with all the world. Our hymn number today is 117, O God, Our Help in Ages Past. The words will appear on your screen. Please join us as we pray. The words appear on the screen. Eternal God, you exist before all things. You crafted the hills and the forests, the rivers and the oceans. You filled them all with life, from the smallest single-celled organisms to the largest creatures, and called them good. You made us, in your image, individual parts of greater whole. Yet. Too often, we try to go alone and do things our own way. Instead of loving our neighbors and sharing the journey with them, we dismiss them and separate ourselves. Forgive us, O oh God. Open our eyes to the gifts you have given us, gifts which you call us to share together. Remind us of what it means to be part of your body and to share your work. Give us the courage to stand together in body or spirit so that we might face the future unafraid. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Our scripture today is from Romans 12, verses 1 through 8. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. 
Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. Just as our bodies have many parts and each has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body and we all belong to each other. In his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, Speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you are a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And you, if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. Here is what God's Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God.
Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. In August 2007, I officially became an Eagle Scout, the highest rank one can earn in the Boy Scouts of America. It was a day of celebration and remembrance as friends, family, and fellow scouts looked back on the journey that had brought me to that point. I'd gone through the scouting program and learned from the many experiences it had to offer. I had shown myself to be a leader, using my gifts and my skills to help those within my troop as well as my community. You're a marked man, one of the assistant scoutmasters said when he rose to speak at my court of honor. Wherever you go, people are going to be watching you. They're going to see who you are and what you do, and they're going to know that that's what it means to be an Eagle Scout. It didn't matter whether I was wearing my uniform or my fancy Eagle Scout pin. My words and my actions were going to speak for themselves. They were going to be what set people's impressions. A few years later, I found myself struggling with what it meant to be identified that way. The Boy Scouts of America at that time had adopted official policy against letting scouts or leaders who identified as LGBTQ participate in units and programs. They argued there were concerns about logistics for meetings and outings, as well as the safety of those involved. But the real reason for the policy was that many of the units were chartered by faith communities and other religious organizations who saw homosexuality as an abomination. And in order to hold on to those often long-standing members and units, the national organization chose to sacrifice those who identified as LGBTQ. Suddenly, my status as an Eagle Scout and my connection to scouting in general weren't exactly something I necessarily wanted to be known for. People were very much aware of what was going on with the national organization, in large part because of how it was all over the news. And they would ask me what I thought about it. Did I agree with the policy? Why couldn't LGBTQ scouts and leaders participate? What good was scouting if it was just going to be stuck in the past? Part of me bristled at these questions and accusations. My own experience of scouting, for the most part, had been rather positive. The same was true for my brothers and for my dad, for my uncles, and for so many of my cousins. Scouting had taught us so much, and we'd all grown, both as individuals and as people who knew what it meant to be part of a cooperative team because of our journey through the program. Meanwhile, some of the folks who were criticizing the organization had never been scouts themselves. They didn't know what it was actually like to be part of the program or to share those experiences with your fellow scouts. All they knew was what they were seeing and hearing on the news. And yet, at the same time, I found myself sharing in their frustration and anger. I was extremely disappointed, ashamed, really, of the decision to exclude scouts and leaders based solely on their sexual orientation. Because scouting had been such a positive influence on my life, I wanted others to be able to have the same opportunity and experiences for themselves. Instead, this decision and the harm that it caused became a barrier, one that we all ultimately had to bear responsibility for. Being an Eagle Scout, meant I represented the scouting organization and everything that it stood for, including its exclusionary policy. How one represents their community and how others perceive them because of it are an important part of what Paul addresses in this passage from his letter to the house churches in Rome. He wrote to those communities of early believers, many of whom were still learning what it meant to follow Christ, and to live as faithful disciples, not to mention witnessing and testifying to that faith in the presence of those around them. And as often as his words were meant to affirm and to encourage, there were definitely times when he also needed to guide and correct them as well. It can't have been easy. 
Not only did the early believers struggle to understand this new thing for themselves and to deal with misinformation within the community of faith, they also had to suffer the rumors and accusations that were leveled against them, especially by the Roman authorities. One common example of this was that Christians were cannibals who feasted on human flesh. In fact, this was likely a misunderstanding of the references to sharing Christ's body and blood during the celebration of Holy Communion. Another was that Christian gatherings were marked by all sorts of immoral behaviors that were incestuous and deviant. Again, this was probably a misunderstanding, most likely of the language around Christ's call to love one another as brothers, sisters, and siblings in the family of God. But some of the things they said about the early Christians were true. And perhaps the greatest and most dangerous of these stemmed from the fact that they were thought of as being disloyal and unpatriotic. They did not embrace the state religion. They did not worship the pantheon of Roman deities or participate in its festivals. They did not give glory to the emperor. They refused to fight in the Roman army and seemed, at least to outsiders, to reject the power and authority of Caesar. Even the language they used to describe their faith, proclaiming Jesus is Lord and referring to him as the Son of God, was considered subversive. All of this put a lot of pressure on believers to conform. At the very least, it seemed as if their lives would have been a lot easier if they just appeared to behave as any other subject of the Roman Empire would, even if it went against what their faith required of them. And that's where Paul's warning, do not be conformed to this world, came into play. We are also under a great deal of pressure to conform in our lives today. It seems like everywhere we turn, the messaging we are inundated with tries to tell us what we need to have and how we should behave if we want to be successful in this life. We've been set up for a rat race, constantly chasing after the next scrap of cheese that is always, always just beyond our reach. Anyone who goes against the system or who calls something out as harmful is seen as disruptive, as a rabble rouser, as someone who doesn't appreciate what's been given to them. Christians, in particular, have gained quite a reputation when it comes to navigating this rat race though not always for the kinds of things one might hope we would. Instead of caring for the poor and the most vulnerable, we see people of faith limiting or even completely taking away access to much-needed services. Instead of welcoming the stranger and the foreigner in our midst, we see faith leaders openly calling for the banning and exclusion of those who are different. There are faith communities in this country that have chosen to bow down before the altars of wealth, power, and fame in hopes that it will raise their standing and secure their future. They seem to reject the model of service, humility, and love exemplified by Jesus Christ. We bristle at the thought, or even the accusation. Our experience of the church and of the faith has more or less probably been a positive one, and we just want to share that with others. We just want to have them experience the same opportunities and joys that we did. And besides, how many of these folks criticizing the church have actually stepped through our doors and given us a chance? How many have really gotten to know us? What do they know besides what they see and hear in the media? At the same time, we can understand, and we often share their frustration and anger. We hear stories of people who didn't have the same positive experiences of church or faith we did. We hear about the things they dealt with, the nasty comments and exclusionary behavior, and were disappointed, ashamed, really. Many of them were burned or otherwise hurt by the church, so often under the guise of love, and usually before they ever got to the actual doors of any church building. I mean, just look at some of the signs you see when you drive down the highway. As people of faith, 
The responsibility ultimately falls on us. Even when we aren't the ones directly causing the harm, we still represent everything Christianity and the United Methodist Church stands for, including all of the things we're not so proud of. We must face the fact that to many, the stories we tell about who Jesus is and who Jesus calls us to be don't really match what the church is actually doing in the world today. Paul's warning, do not be conformed to this world, is a warning for us too. But ever the apostle and prophet, Paul never chastised those early communities without also offering them God's hope. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, he told them, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. In other words, it wasn't just about saying the right thing or even doing the right thing, but rather living their entire lives in ways that put God at the center and bore witness to God's love for all the people. They had to allow God's spirit to transform their hearts and to make them more like God's heart so that every word, every action that came out of them would be coming out of that same good and acceptable and perfect source. Doing so meant having to reorganize, to put things in their proper order. Paul called on them not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. And again, we see that the source is God, and that the gift of faith, along with all the other gifts it brings, comes from God. Putting God in first position and remembering God's generosity was an important step on the journey of growing a more Christ-like heart. This wasn't something that could be done alone. No one person could go off and figure out everything by themselves. In order to live and grow as faithful disciples, they needed the community of faith, for better or for worse. Paul illustrated this using the image of a body, something made of many parts, but still existing as a unified whole. Each part had its different strengths and weaknesses, its gifts and graces that allowed it to carry out its function within the context of the body. In fact, God had given them different gifts precisely so that they could help the whole body better live into its call as a community of disciples. If we want to change the impression others have of Christians, then we have to be intentional about first allowing ourselves to be transformed and then working together and using the gifts we have to offer another alternative. While it's true that some faith voices were involved in the Boy Scouts' decision to exclude scouts and leaders who identified as LGBTQ, those were not the only voices involved in the conversation, nor were they the only ones offering a faith-based perspective. The United Methodist Men, along with several other faith communities and religious organizations, spoke out against the ban. They used their influence to encourage a more inclusive approach, one which came from the convictions of their faith and the certainty that we are all called to love one another as Christ loved us. Their efforts and their witness to God's love in their community eventually paid off. In 2015 and in 2016, the Boy Scouts of America reversed their policy decisions and opened their organization to all scouts and leaders without regard to sexual orientation. It may not feel like we are ready to take on a challenge as great as changing the policies of a national organization or a worldwide denomination. Believe me, I know how intimidating that is. But that doesn't mean God isn't calling us to reach out, to make a difference in someone's life, or to change something right here in our own community. Our ministry with the folks who come to the drive-up food pantry offers a hope-filled response to the issues many of them face in their everyday lives. Food scarcity, economic struggle, instability of employment all make it that much more difficult for anyone to thrive. When we see them, 
and acknowledge them as beloved children of God, we are living out of God's perfect love. The same is true when we are willing to provide space for the little school, for the Red Cross blood drives, and for our addiction support groups. We are giving them a chance to experience the church and the church building as a place of growth, acceptance, and new life. And when we commit ourselves to the slower, more cautious path toward returning to in-person ministry amid this COVID-19 pandemic, we are showing our love for God and for neighbor. We are saying that public health shouldn't be a partisan thing, but a common good thing. This is an opportunity for us to get creative, to use those different gifts and graces that God has given us, and to find ways of connecting with one another, as well as with those who might not already be part of this congregation. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living offering, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship, Paul wrote to those early Christians. Now is the time for us to show what it really means to be one of Jesus' disciples in the ways that we speak and act and live. May it be so according to God's will. Amen. of the body of Christ, we have been given wondrous and abundant gifts to share not only amongst ourselves, but with the world around us. God calls us to share in the work that God is doing, and we offer up our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. Especially in the midst of this COVID-19 pandemic, even though our church building is closed, the ministry and mission of our congregation continues and your financial support helps make that possible. As you continue to give, you are invited to do so by mailing your offering to the church. You can call the church office and set up an electronic fund transfer. You can go to our website and give online, or you can text using the information that appears on your screen. If you are a member of another faith community that is worshiping with this video, we encourage you to give to your faith community so that you can share in the work that God is doing where you are. In addition to financial gifts, we also have opportunity to lift up prayers before God. And so I invite you in these moments to enter into a spirit and attitude of prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for this day, for the beauty of the season around us, and for the life that is springing forth in the midst of your creation. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who lived and walked among us, who showed us what it means to love and to serve you, to love and to serve all those around us. Because he was among us, we know that you understand what it's like to be us, because he experienced the highs and the lows of this human life, we know that you understand them yourself. And so we trust that as we lift our hearts to you, you hold them close to your own, that our joys and our sorrows are wrapped up in your all-encompassing love. God, we lift before you today those whose lives continue to be affected by the spread of COVID-19 both directly by the virus itself, as well as by the measures that continue to be taken in an effort to slow its spread. May we extend your comfort and healing mercy to those in need in our communities as we share your love and compassion with those around us. We pray for those who've had to make difficult decisions, the decision of whether to stay home, the decision of how best to socially distance themselves, 
the decision to have to cancel or postpone events, even this far into this experience. May they know your comforting presence in the midst of their isolation and uncertainty. We pray for those who are protesting over life and death concerns around the world, and especially for those in Belarus, in Hong Kong, and across the United States, that we may learn to see your radical love and inclusion at work in their efforts for justice. We pray for students, for teachers, for parents, and their communities who are facing hard choices around starting school, especially in the United States and particularly in our community of Portage, Wisconsin, that your wisdom and compassion might be made known in the midst of it all. God, we lift before you the refugees here in the United States and around the world who are fleeing war, disaster, and violence, only to be told they are not welcome and forcefully turned back, that our hearts may be open to these and that we would learn to see the image of you in each of them. We pray also for our president, for his administration, and all our elected officials, wherever they may be serving, that together we might work toward your vision for our world, one of your peace, your justice, your love. Holy God, hear our prayers. Give us what we need to be faithful members of the body of Christ and to share in the work that you are doing in the world. We ask these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, and by the power of your Holy Spirit, as we pray together the words Christ taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 2220, We Are God's People. The words appear on your screen. Friends, as we go from this digital space, know that we do not go alone. 
but as members of the body of Christ, with the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, to love and serve God and neighbor in all we do, now and forevermore. Go in peace. Amen. Mm -hmm.